Alrighty, everyone. So we are going to get started. I would like to welcome you all to Leap's Impacts of COVID-19 in Brock University webinar. We are going to be starting off the evening with Impacts of COVID-19. So I'd like to get started a little bit on our agenda. Um, so we'll be going over a little bit of an overview of LEAP. We'll introduce our lovely panelists, go into our discussion, and have a little bit of a Q&A period. If you are staying for the Brock University panel, we'll have a little bit of a break, and then we'll jump right back into Brock. Um, we just have a couple of things for you. Um, as you're listening to our panel, we would love for everyone to please keep your microphones and cameras off throughout the session. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box. Our panelists will be answering questions throughout uh, the webinar, as well as kind of collecting some of them to answer towards the end as well. So we'll go into our overview of LEAP. So those of you who may not have heard of LEAP before, we are, we are a student-run organization dedicated to helping students learn more about the post-secondary institution they have committed to through the panels, like the ones that you're uh, viewing today. We want to empower students to find their own personal brand and be confident heading into their first year of university because it can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, we want to assist students in the process of applying, choosing the right post-secondary institution for them, and transitioning to university life. And we want to prepare students through insight and guidance to be ready for an unforgettable post-secondary experience, no matter where you're headed, and no matter if you are going online or in person, which is going to be a little bit about what we are talking today. So I'd like to introduce our panelists today, beginning with Daniel. Hello, everyone. So my name is Daniel. I go to Brock University. I am entering my second year of the medical sciences program, and I'm involved in a wide variety of activities at Brock. So I listed a couple here. Um, so I'm on the Leadership Society, the Students' Union, I was part of the curling team and I'm on a couple other things. Um, so I know a few things that are gonna be changing and how things are going to be affecting you. And also um, I have my own experience from online learning. So I hope to um, be able to answer some of your questions. Fantastic. Hi, my name's Lily. I'm at the University of Western Ontario entering my second year of classics. So I'm on quite a bit of uh, student councils at Western, so I kind of am privy to the information about how COVID-19 is going to affect faculties, classrooms, events, like all that kind of stuff. And I'm ready to kind of help you guys navigate that transition. Fantastic. Yeah, so hey guys, uh, my name is Sheldon. Uh, I'm uh, oh, I just actually finished second year yesterday, had my final exam. So just congratulations. Here at, um, <laughs> On, I'm in the science and business program at Waterloo. So basically, yeah, like, uh, ironically, that I'm talking at, on this panel, because uh, while, uh, while everyone was in school, I was actually on co-op, so I got caught in the middle of everything, and I just finished my full term online, so I just kind of got a feel for like everything. So yeah, hope to have fun here, uh, answer your questions, especially about, like, I guess, for those of you about questions, if you guys in the co-op program, or anything about, like, online learning, so yeah. Awesome, thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Sidra. I'm actually um, a recent graduate of the food science program at the University of Guelph. So I kind of graduated in all the craziness that was happening. And hopefully that means that things will be more prepared in the fall semester. Um, so I like anything, food, nutrition, health, wellness, that kind of thing. I volunteered at our career services, our wellness center on campus, as well as Kids Help Home. And I've done a lot of um, online courses as well as have an interest in like productivity and stuff like that. So I hope to have a really good discussion going on. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so the panel discussion that we're going to be having today includes online academics, online socials, um, as well as productivity, and then some final tips. Um, before we jump into it, I kind of forgot to introduce myself. So hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay. I'll be the host for the first half of the evening. I am the PR director for Leap Canada. And I also want to give a quick disclaimer. I'm sure you all know um, none of this covers any sort of medical advice. LEAP is not responsible for any of that. We have some amazing panelists here that are going to provide you some options and some of their opinions about uh, post-secondary life, but especially in a time like this, your decision is the right one for you. So make sure that although you're listening to uh, the opinions given by other people on this panel today, whatever choice you make, it is totally your own. Um, know that whatever you do, it's the right thing for you. Um, so with that, let's jump in.
we're going to start with academics. So Sheldon and Daniel, um, I want to talk a little bit about the format for lectures and tutorials. Can you give a little bit of what people might be expecting when we're going online for these kind of things? I guess I'll go first. So yeah, so after for me, at least I just finished my whole term, like, as I said yesterday. Um, with regarding, I guess, for those of you going into university, you guys are expecting something called tutorials. Uh, at least for me, like in my second year courses, I actually didn't really have any tutorials. Um, basically, all the lectures come in PowerPoint formats. So yeah, it's like your typical, they'll just post them probably weekly, once a week, two times a week at max. Usually, they'll just post it, there's a voice recording on it. So you probably just like read over the slides along with the voice recording. So like as if you're kind of in class, kind of like a simulation type of thing. And then if you guys, some of you are in sciences too, I understand that and you guys will definitely, are supposed to have labs in first year. Um, at least for the labs that I had in my like previous, like current summer term, all of them were online. So essentially they'd post videos of what you were supposed to do in the labs. But then after that, they'd post out the data that you, that you were supposed to collect within the lab. From there, like the lab instructions for what you're supposed to do for the final report is all given. Um, I had one professor that did a weekly live session, and I know a couple of my friends that had it too. Um, but majority is all just pre-recorded and everything. And definitely, emails are really good communication tools for reaching out to professors and TAs, especially during a time like this. So don't feel free to just like bombard them with questions because they actually do respond relatively quickly right now, surprisingly. <laughs> Absolutely. Daniel, do you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, so just to repeat some of the things, like he's, Sheldon mentioned that you will have a lot of classes that will just be the PowerPoint posted with voiceover. Um, it depends on what the course is. So at Brock, they specifically have on your course, it'll say sync or async. So sync means synchronous, and that means you'll be having a weekly lecture or a specific specified time. And async will mean that they'll be posting the slides with a voiceover. Um, so for labs and tutorials, there's a couple different ways they can do that as well. Um, so as Sheldon mentioned, they could post the video for you of what you'd be doing. Um, some will actually have a video chat that you'll be joining and you'll be doing some things that you can on a computer. Um, and for some science labs like chemistry or biology, they sometimes will um, post the results for you and then you can write your lab report based off those. And so both of you kind of went into this not really expecting, I don't think any of us were expecting the online schooling. What do you think was the most difficult thing about the transition from in-person classes to online classes? Um, I can go first if you want, Sheldon. So um, the most difficult thing that I found was adapting to the change in schedule. So before I was going to my weekly classes or my daily classes, depending on what the course was, and I had a set schedule that I had to abide by because it was set by the school. Um, but once I, the, the way they changed it, they just posted the PowerPoints with the voiceover. So it was more of a, I have to take the initiative and make sure I follow my own education guidelines. So it was difficult to set something up for myself of a uh, routine to um, get all of my work done and study and things. So uh, it, it's good that we now know and we're able to prepare for September where we know we're gonna be doing some different course things. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Sheldon? Yeah, for sure. And just to, like build off with what Daniel really said, um, the main surprise for me that really was um, basically time management, um, really, especially with like a full course, though, like first year, second year, like Daniel said, it's very structured. Like you have your schedule, you set a routine, you go there every day, you sit in class. And you, like when basically you have someone just kind of explaining the content to you. What I realized was that, at least for me, was that it kind of took more time to understand things because it's kind of like you're, you're learning it by yourself, essentially. You don't really have like the professor there. So like if you have like a question in the middle of a lecture, you can't just like, you know, pause. Unless you have like a live lecture, then definitely. But most of them are online, like I said. So a change for me was definitely a lot of self-discipline and good time management. Because you're not on a structure anymore, you know, you have 24 hours in a day to really access all your content. So you just kind of have to, I guess, what works best for you to kind of prioritize which courses are going to be like, you know, the ones that probably need more time versus like some other courses that require a little less time, you know, um, even from in university, you are going to have 
definitely courses that take definitely like a much longer time. So make sure you just kind of, you know, cater to that, you know, a cert, certain time slots. A really good suggestion for me that I kind of did halfway was that I just made my own little schedule as if I'd get a timetable from the school. I would set that up and then have an alarm and just set for it and just kind of have a structure for myself. And yeah, and it worked really nicely. Yeah, I definitely think that's a good way to do it, especially when you're not operating on somebody else's schedule anymore. Um, definitely an exercise in self-regulation. Um, we had a question in our chat that Lizzie, uh, Lily sorry, answered about any sort of note-taking apps or strategies that you might have implemented. Do you guys have any suggestions for the audience? Um, well, for me at least, I didn't really have any like note-taking kind of apps that I used. Um, I'm kind of like an old school person. Like I learned better when I take notes by hand, but over like the courses, like I felt like, oh, it was like, cause some of the lecture slides are pretty long. So I didn't really have the time to like hand write them down. So what I really actually did was I probably, I mentioned it in like the next PowerPoint, but it was a really good question. But what I did was while I was listening to the PowerPoint, I'd type in the comment section in the actual PowerPoint to jot down quick notes and stuff like that. And after when I finished like a whole lecture, I'd probably retype them up on a document, which is more organized when you guys are going to go through it at the end of, like at the end of the term, you guys are preparing for a midterm or an exam. Or if you do have the time, like me, like I just actually wrote, wrote them like all hands down and like just a summary of like everything, including like my comments that I took from like, you know, the audio recording. So yeah, um, note taking apps, I actually don't really know that many. So if any of you guys know, you guys can shoot, you know, let me know too, because I'm definitely, you know, open to that. <laughs> Lily, do you want to jump in with this, the suggestion that you made? Yeah, so I use, I actually learned about in high school, it's called Evernote. My uh, teachers use it. Um, I started using Evernote in university and it was actually extremely helpful. I actually, after a month, chipped in for the paid version and the paid version um, unlocks a whole other range of <laughs> capabilities and it was really helpful for me to use. Um, I specifically used Evernote to take down like you can copy your the entire slideshow and lecture onto Evernote and then take notes under the headings. So you don't have to like go through and type everything or copy paste it. You can just upload the slideshow onto Evernote and then, um, or lecture, however they put it, and then you can take notes underneath it. So that's how I used it and it was like extremely helpful and it got me through a lot of classes. Amazing. Yeah, I think when you get into the paid version, like if it's a little less money that you're spending on notebooks or something, it probably adds up to make it worth it anyway. Sidra, do you have any specific note taking strategies or uh, apps that you used? Um, so I have to agree with Sheldon, like I'm pretty old school too. Um, I like to actually write out summaries. I like to write something at least because it's really good for me and for my learning to have things written down on paper. Um, but actually what I like to do is take PowerPoints and convert them into PDF through like a free converter online. And then there's an edit function on PDFs and you can kind of just like type in things under headings, under pictures, whatever it is, so that it's kind of all on one screen. You don't have to like go like separately to your Word doc that has notes for slide 16 and things can get a little bit disorganized. Um, and then when I had that PDF, I would, if it was content heavy, I'd have um, notes on Word, uh, Microsoft Word, like the, just like screenshots and stuff like that in there. And then I would write out a summary to really like, like hit it home or whatever that saying is. Yeah, absolutely. And whatever works, right? Like it's great to have these suggestions, but obviously all of us are very different studiers. So it's definitely whatever works for you. So we're going to take a full 180 and go over to the social side of university. So Lily and Sidra, I want to talk to you a little bit about the best way to kind of make friends, network, get involved in university when everything is going virtual. So for me at least, uh, I would take advantage of study groups. Study groups are an amazing thing in person, but they're also going to be extremely helpful virtually. With COVID-19, access to in-person materials is limited, so the popularity of virtual study groups are going to rise. You can use online resources like your university's Facebook groups that are created by students, like, for example, I have Western Must Knows or Western Graduate 2023 group. Um, you can post on there and create um, study groups from there and study your virtual classes on there. Um, you'll meet people who have similar interests and who you can spend hours with studying. 
Yeah, fantastic. I think they're a great way to get involved with people and without kind of having to put yourself out there in a really stressful environment. You're all there for the same reason. So it's kind of a great place to bond, especially if you're not quite sure what you're studying. So you can kind of all, you know, create a friendship over a, a difficult class or a course or whatever it is that you're doing. Sidra, how about you? Yeah, so I, I'd echo what um, Lily's saying for uh, connecting to other students. I found Facebook pretty helpful, like the group chats and the, um, the groups themselves. Um, LinkedIn, everyone's probably heard of already. I made a LinkedIn pretty late in university, and I would, if I could go back, I'd make that earlier just to really build a good network. Um, LinkedIn is nice because you can kind of search for people based on the schools they're attending or the company they're working at or what uh, career path they're on. And you can use that to your advantage and reach out to them for some advice or tips. I mean, it's kind of nice to have a, a network going in because you might have like a second connection with them or a first connection even. And then that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then I would say for networking, like emailing professors, emailing grad students, upper year students, staff at the university, you can definitely do that too. But just be careful that you don't sound super generic and like every other student. Because now that the pandemic's hit, everyone's just gonna get so many more emails. And professors don't wanna, they wanna have like, what's it called, like students that stand out when they look for uh, people to work in their lab or help with research or stuff like that. So whatever you can do to make yourself stand out, um, whether that be talking about your previous experiences and bringing that to light, or talking about them and, and talking about their research and what um, interested you and um, stuff like that. So a cool tip that I like to use when I used to do resume critiques is that someone shouldn't be able to copy something off of your resume or off of your little um, email pitch and paste it onto theirs and be able to get away with it because it should be unique and you should be able to stand out. That's a fantastic kind of principle to have. I've never really thought of doing something like that, but that's an amazing suggestion. And I think what you mentioned about reaching out to your profs, TAs, is such an important thing, especially when we're all going to be online, just tiny little pictures on Zoom or uh, whatever platform your prof is going to be using. So putting yourself out there in a unique way, I think is definitely critical. Um, we'll talk about events a little bit. You guys have both had experience in extracurriculars. Do you, can you give some advice? And obviously this is university specific. It might apply to some others. Not every school is going to do the same thing. Um, but can you give a little bit of a summary about how events will run in a new online format? So I have a little bit of inside experience for this. I'm a VP of events for my student council faculty. So I'm actually planning events for my faculty. Um, it's definitely been hard. <laughs> Um, it's extremely hard to reach out to vendors, extremely hard to reach out to even faculty members because no one knows what it's going to look like later on in the year. But we have been, I listed some examples in the slideshow, but we have been trying to think of unique ideas that's not just Zoom focused. Um, some examples of those ideas would be um, the activities, uh, long distance activities. Um, basically, we're hoping to be able to send care packages or quarantine crafts to people in different provinces and hopefully internationally. So it can kind of connect you back. For example, we're doing a quarantine craft box where you can paint and then upload it to our university's page and everybody gets the same amount of painting materials from all over the world and you can just post it online. Um, th there's also off-campus events. So um, even though the campus might be restricted on what you can do in campus, of course, with social distancing and masks and safety precautions, we're looking at throwing things off campus, like group outings to restaurants that on the patio, or, do we, or taking advantage of platforms like Goose Chase to do a community-wide scavenger hunt that makes sure you don't interact with people, but you see different locations in the London community or the Hamilton community or St. Catharines. Um, yeah, so, and also community volunteering programs because COVID-19 is insane and people need a lot of help in your community and it's always nice to give back. Yeah, oh, those are all fantastic ideas and I love that you're kind of branching away from just the standard Zoom idea of getting to know each other and getting clubs involved. Like I think actually sending out physical stuff to people is going to be a great way to kind of get them involved in the university atmosphere, even if they're not necessarily going to be there. Uh, Sidra, do you have anything to add on there? I don't really think I have anything to, the only thing I'd say is that I reached out to 
the clubs uh, at the University of Guelph, and they basically said that they're not having any in-person um, events happening on campus. Off campus is a different story, but they're not gonna have anything on campus as of now for safety reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Most universities are going to be following a similar protocol. Um, I'm sure all of us are going into a very similar situation of all online classes for the fall semester. Um, so definitely don't feel let down. Uh, obviously, it's tough when we think that there's going to be frosh or different events that we can attend and go to in person, and they're not necessarily happening the way that uh, we expected them to. Um, so I want to kind of turn this question to everyone. Uh, we will start with Sidra because you have a point down on the slide, um, but will students be missing out if they stay at home versus go back to campus? Well, I have to start off by saying it's like a situation dependent thing. And so whatever your situation allows for, because your safety is number one priority. And I know some schools are having students come back for hands-on labs or for smaller seminars or something, um, as long as they're socially distanced and following proper pro the protocol. But I think most lectures will probably be probably be online um, and you're gonna you're gonna miss out in the sense of like that campus feel and being in, in the lecture environment and getting that hands-on stuff but is it worth risking your safety um, and is it even a normal circumstance not really right so even if you are on campus it's not like how it would be like normally um, so another thing I want to say is by having everything online the positive side to that is that you can also just access a lot of cool things online that you normally wouldn't do uh, should you have been on campus. So a lot of resources, for example, like when I was at the Wellness Center, when I was at Career Services, you had to come in physically. We didn't have stuff for, for um, online help, which is crazy. I think that uh, a lot of clubs or a lot of um, services should take that into consideration. But um, now that you're online, like you can access a lot of these things now. So take that to your advantage. Absolutely. Um, Daniel, would you like to add on? Just kind of an echo of Citra, like you have to take your health into account first and not to diminish what the, um, the organizations and the groups at universities are going to be trying to put together for you, but it, it may be more important for you to stay safe and stay at home rather than to attend those events. Um, I don't, I don't think I have much more to say. It's just your safety. Yeah, no, I can absolutely agree. I think we can all kind of sound off on that. Um, I think personally, a suggestion that I would give to everyone going off to university, especially if you're going into first year, I'm in the same boat as you. I've been to first year. I'm going back into first year. It was a really critical look at my pros and cons, as Sidra mentions in the slide, of whether I should go to residence, whether I shouldn't, whether I should stay at home, whether I should go to Ottawa, all that kind of stuff. And once again, you are the only person that can really decide that. There are a lot of factors that are going into this health, school opportunities in person, um, finances, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and keep in mind, if you know it is kind of the snag that's uh, holding you back, once again, universities are trying to move everything online because they understand that a lot of students are going to be more comfortable staying at home. Um, so I agree with you, Sidra. It's definitely going to feel like you're missing out on some of the traditional parts of university, but you have another three and a half years to get there. So I think it'll, it'll, it's a little bit tough. It's a little bit of a roadblock, but everyone will kind of get that experience at one point or another. And hey, this will be a story we will tell our grandchildren. Um, so I think that's kind of something to keep in mind. I'm going to turn this on to all of you now. Um, we kind of discussed this a little bit before um, about best time management and organizational tips during an online semester. Um, we all have our different strategies. We'll go through them a little bit more and kind of delve deep into how you fix your own schedule and how you kind of keep yourself on track when we are so tempted by being at home. Would anyone like to start us off? I can start off just because my point's there. For sure. um, so I could literally talk about this forever, but I'll keep it to a minimal. Um, so I, uh, when you enter university, you usually are given an email account that's associated with either like Gmail, Outlook, Office 365. And using that calendar function, I don't know why it took me like two, three years <laughs> to use that, but um, it's amazing because like Daniel said, now you need structure because you don't have structure. So basically, um, 
booking in times for lectures, booking in study sessions with friends and sending them invites so that they can keep it on their calendar, um, booking in time for when you will do things. So the concept of a to-do calendar, because you're putting a time um, for when you will get something done, a time and a date. So if I need to write a paper and I want to write the intro, I'm going to do it Thursday at 3 p.m. for an hour. I book that time for it. So I'm more likely to get that done. Um, when I was uh, uh, graduating from Guelph, Microsoft Teams was something that we were using in our volunteer team. Uh, it's a collaborative collaborative workspace where you can edit documents in real time. You can uh, you have group chats, you can do video conferencing. Um, and we I, I'm working full time right now. And that's what we use um, uh, for work. So it really kind of helps. So you don't have like a Facebook chat going on and you have like a Google Doc and like tons of stuff. And so it kind of just keeps it all in one place. Um, so maybe look into that. Um, and then lastly, I know that like I will let myself down a lot, but I don't really like to let other people down. So if I if I'm booking a session with my friend for okay, maybe not a friend, maybe I that's not even gonna work. But if I have a study session at uh, Friday at 1 p.m. for Psych 1000, I don't want to let my study group down, and I'm gonna do what I can to get prepared so I don't look like a slacker. So it, even if you just want to like put on a video conference or um, whatever go on zoom with your friend and then get some stuff done like that could help you um so that you're not kind of like wasting your time and not getting anything done absolutely some fantastic tips there especially with collaborating with someone else i think that's a good way to hold both of you accountable or several of you accountable um sheldon i'll turn to you because you have just finished going through online school so you've been right through the thick of it any organizational tips time management uh suggestions that you may have already not touched on previous yeah, for sure. To add on to Sidra, like definitely for sure. Um, working in groups definitely helps. But also, uh, because it's online, and I guess like you guys going into first, you guys definitely do feel like it's like another world you're entering. Um, yeah, definitely reach out to people like the group chats actually do work. But also in the same time, there is a level of independence that you'll need. Um, and one thing I really realized that um, throughout like the thick, thick and thin of it was going through a full course load was your phone is a very big distraction. The amount of time you spend on it, you realize actually how much time you're gonna waste. So, you know, like Sidra said, like, yeah, you can cater an hour for like, say a paper that you wanna write, say like get through like an intro that you can probably write within an hour. But then if you're on your phone, like for like 15 minutes of it, you're down to like just 45 minutes and then you start slacking and then you're like, oh, like procrastination is a big thing with the phone. So I say like what, what I do, at least when I study, like, I put my phone like in another room like some people say like like a lot of people just try to do that I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of like everyone else tells you to do that too but like actually doing it like I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's only 10% of us that actually do it and when I actually do it like the amount of time you actually save is incredible you know and like the time they spend on your phone it actually adds up at the end you know because usually like in a day like hey I just only have like two things to do in a day that should probably only take me two or three hours, but then sometimes adding my phone into it, it takes me like five to six hours. And then like, say I have plans with family or friends and then like that gets ruined because you know, I didn't hold myself accountable. So say if you guys really do set aside hours to actually say, I'm gonna go through a lecture, I'm gonna do this assignment, like actually give it the full hour, you know, without having distractions, you know, like with me, like to be honest, I have a very short attention span. I have like, like my attention span is like tiny. It's like a peanut, literally. But what I really have to say is like, like for me, it's that I do like 20 minute sessions. So I would study for 20 minutes straight and then probably take a five, 10 minute break while on my phone, but I literally have the self-discipline and control to put my phone away after, you know, 20, 10 minutes, because I'm always telling myself like, Hey, the faster I get this done, the more, you know, time I can have, you know, spending my time with my family, you know, watching Netflix because I love Netflix, but mainly just like, yeah, self-control with your phone is a big thing that you'll start realizing. Absolutely. And I couldn't have segued better myself because we wanted to go a little bit of, uh, into distractions, managing your daily routine. How do we avoid distractions when we're at home and how do we kind of build a new routine here? Uh, so I'll go first since my point's up. Um, I may be an art student, but let's, let's stick into like some brain science here for a second. <laughs> your ability to retain information diminishes after about 30 minutes. 
So I would recommend personally to break it up into multiple smaller sessions. So reward yourself in those smaller sessions with fun activities during your break. Like for example, when I was in residence, I would go down to the cafe and get some food on my break, or I would play on my phone, but with Sheldon's tip, make sure you're able to put it down afterwards. Um, ways to like not get distracted is you can also have a designated study group. So more like science, when you associate something, it actually helps. Like when you, with your bed, you get tired when you sit on your bed. So if you have a designated study space in your room or a study room or your desk in your room, when you sit down, you're already going to be in the headspace to start studying. So as long as you say, hey, at 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., I'm going to study for 30 minutes at this desk, take a break in another room, go back and study at the desk. You basically set aside the appropriate amount of time to study and also made sure you're going to be focused and retaining all that information and not mentally exhausting yourself. Absolutely. Daniel, do you have anything you'd like to add on there? Um, so I totally agree with Lily. She has a lot of great points there. Um, I'd like to also add like about your designated study space. That's a great idea. I think um, it's also a good idea if you have a couple spaces that you could go to that you could study within your house or uh, if you can go somewhere that's a little out in the public but private. Um, because it's good to have a rotation so it doesn't get to be, oh, that old study space, oh, I don't want to do that, like something like that. Um, yeah, I think like it's a really good idea to um, also get an agenda or get a whiteboard so that you can plot your ideas down and make sure you know what you want to be doing and like you don't have to time yourself minute by minute, but um, put something together that's kind of bare bones and you can follow it to um, a degree. Absolutely. And I think once again, that's the whole theme of this presentation. It, things work differently for everyone. And some people have a tip that works for them and does not work at all for somebody else. I want to ask you guys what the first thing that you do when you sit down at your desk, how do you avoid distractions? So what's the first thing that you do to make sure that you're getting in your study mindset? Sidra, do you have, would you like to answer first? Well, from now on, I'm going to put my phone away, like Sheldon said, so that'll really help me. Um, I don't really, that's a good question. I don't really think I have anything. Maybe just like clean up my tabs. But like one thing I've been doing is using this app called Cold Turkey where it blocks off like distracting websites. So if I know I really need to get something done, I will use that app and it'll block off like a lot of the distracting websites so I can get work done. Absolutely. How about you, Lily? Put a do not disturb sign on your door. <laughs> no, um, in university, our SOTS kind of like gave us this thing that said like free to come in or um, like sleeping or whatever. So like you could turn them on your door and it was supposed to um, encourage social interaction, but also not distract you if you need to study. Um, so in my first year, that was really helpful. I turned it and then I could sit down at my desk and study. Um, but for those of you that don't have that, maybe like make one or like say if you're in a house next year with your friends or in the university residences, employ that same thing like open door, closed door policy. Um, make sure people know on your floor that you're studying or go to the study space in your residence. Yeah, absolutely. And I think since we're living at home, something that we might want to implement and that I'm going to have to learn to implement now that I'm living with my parents again is setting out a very strict schedule and being very open with them about when I am working and when I am not. Um, there is nothing worse than when you're in the middle of a Zoom call and you get a knock at the door from a parent or a sibling who doesn't know that you're in the middle of a class or a meeting. Um, so even if you're looking to establish a family calendar or if you can just send a message to whoever you're living with, just being like, hey, I'm in class now for the next two hours. Please don't bother me. Um, it's something that I definitely took for granted when I live on residence. Um, but now that I'm living with three other people again, it's something that I will definitely need to employ. Um, Daniel, any suggestions again for how you avoid distraction, how you kind of get into your study mindset at home? Yeah, of course. Um, so I don't actually have like a first thing that I go to or like a first thing that I do. But I heard recently that it's the hardest part to getting in the mindset and doing something is like just starting it like you distract yourself before you even get into the activity so I think it's just getting yourself sitting down and starting whether you it doesn't matter you don't have to have a plan of what you're going to be doing when you sit down as long as you 
log into your computer and just check out the website that your class is on or something like that, your brain will start to develop what a plan for what you want to do that day or in that time if you don't already have one. So I think just get started and it'll go. I'm getting so many fantastic suggestions. I hope everyone else is learning from this because there are so many things that it's lovely to take in as a student, even if we've already gone through the study process, because it's nice to just even have someone affirm what we might have already experienced. Like if we think, oh, you know, like it's easier once I open the textbook and the scientist tells you that you're right, it is easier once you open the textbook. Um, I think that's fantastic to hear. And I think it kind of gives us all some little tips and pointers for when we do jump back into online learning. Um, we'll finish up with some final tips. I'll turn this over to you guys. What final piece of advice would you like to give to first year university students? COVID specific, not COVID specific, both, either, whatever. Um, anyone, if you would like to begin, go right ahead. Um, as first years, especially those in residence, you're gonna feel confined to your room with no motivation. Um, it's going to be really hard, especially with the residence policy this year where you no longer in a double room with a roommate, you're alone. So um, whether it be co-ops, clubs, faculty events, or virtual programming, it's still so worth it to have these experiences and opportunities, even if they're not going to be the same as they would be any other year. It's good to have them under your belt because realistically, as first years, it's going to get you more associated with your campus and give you that family and community um, feeling. So do it anyway. You'll regret it if you don't. Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic suggestion for all first years is get involved in something as long as time and schedule allows um, because, you know, you want to get your roots planted as soon as you possibly can and as soon as you're comfortable with it. How about you, Sheldon? Yeah, for me, yeah, because uh, joining first year and then trying to like join clubs is definitely one of like the highlights and like an important part of you know the university lifestyle but uh also taking like you guys have to remind yourself especially going to first year like yeah like no residence for some of you and like you guys aren't enjoying like fully like you know i guess like the full first year experience but like Lindsay said you guys still have three like three years left right and the main point that you guys are going to university is for an education right so you guys really need to be you know constantly grateful that you guys do have the opportunity to continue education you know you know despise everything that's going on right now and more on the academic side you know and adding on to lily's point yeah join clubs definitely but also know that maintain a good balance between like you know your academic schoolwork and alongside with like the clubs that you join you don't want to take too much clubs and then it's going to start your grades start to slip right because online especially university in general like deadlines are definitely cl closer than they appear too so especially like when you guys do get caught up and like, you know, the schedule gets packed sometimes and like your grades are going to be sometimes like up and down, up and down, maybe not for some of you, but for me, it definitely was, but you guys just need to have the mentality of just keep pushing through, you know, like, okay, say if like I got like a 60 on the quiz, all right, next one bounce back. You got to just keep moving on. You can't just, you don't, you won't really have the time to sit there and dwell on it. You just got to be like a bulldozer and just like keep crushing it through, you know, like on my first year calc midterm, like I thought, because it was first year and like everything in class was like all review. So I just got really cocky about it. Yeah, I ended up with a 35 on that midterm. <laughs> so, you know, guys, like, you guys definitely just like, but I didn't have the time to dwell on it. I just had to, you know, start doing my homework, pull out the books, you know, go, go to my classes, you know, and like attend every lecture, take notes, you know, put your head down, you know, like everyone's, you know, you're, it's, it's, if it's too easy, then, you know, then, then, then there's definitely something wrong. So, Definitely keep a positive mentality, keep pushing through, you know, and because at the end it will work out. Okay. Some very, very fantastic words of wisdom to live by throughout university, COVID or not, um, especially with your classes. Definitely keep going to your lectures, even though they're online. I think that might be a little bit difficult for some of us at first when we could just hit snooze and go back to bed but you really have to keep in mind how some of your lectures will still be running if you would like to go to bed and it might not be the best option for you just to go back to sleep or miss them. So definitely make sure you're getting those. It's a different experience for sure, uh, but something you're going to want to follow up on because it's still school, right? It's different, but it's still school. Um, Sudra, what piece of advice would you like to give? So tying it back to the getting involved piece, uh, I would say that if there's something that you want to do and it scares you and it's something that 
you would you feel like I could never see myself doing that I would do the challenge of like I call it the one uh, challenge a semester but I feel like doing things that scare you getting involved in stuff like that is really just a good growing opportunity and really helps you to learn so that you're not just leaving university with like a degree right um, you want to build your skills you want to build your self-confidence and so that's what um, that would relate to and also COVID specific I think that we all need to, and even me, need to um, focus on ergonomics and keeping ourselves healthy in terms of our muscles and our joints, because we will be on uh, our computers for longer hours, and we don't want to um, cause anything, cause any long-term effects or anything like that. Absolutely. If this is the time to invest in a nice desk chair, I would definitely recommend it. How about you, Danielle? Um, so I love Sidra's point about ergonomics. It's very important. Like I'm actually sitting on the ground right now, which is definitely not the best. Um, and my computer's on a cardboard box, but uh, I, I think he very much so invest in ergonomics and make sure you're going to be healthy throughout this. Make sure you're keeping your posture correct and even do posture exercises. Um, but another important thing is that you um, you don't be afraid of introducing yourself and making friends, whether it be online or if I don't know if you're going to be in person at all, but um, maybe in January if they have us back, if it's safe um, in person, don't be afraid to do those sorts of things. And I think it's also important to follow like the social media accounts for um, your university or your students union or even your club um, social media accounts because they'll be posting so much about their events and their networking opportunities and things like that. So those will be great chances for you to get to meet other people, whether it just be virtual or if it's in person when that's available. For sure. And I think for any of you who may be attending this webinar who are going to uh, residence in first semester, I know I said we're not providing health advice, but we I think it's in our right to say, please follow the guidelines that are outlined by your university. It's going to be very tempting going to residence with a bunch of people that you really want to meet. But just remember that those guidelines are in place for your safety. Um, so there will definitely be other events that your residents will be running to try and make up for the lack of physical gatherings that everyone can have, um, but follow those. Make the most of what is offered to you. It's definitely going to be weird and you might be like, I don't want to join another Zoom conversation, um, but just take it as a replacement for something else that you might be doing in person uh, in a regular term one may say. Um, we're going to go to Q&A for the last few minutes. Feel free to head over to the chat box if you haven't already um, and fill in some questions that you have for the panelists. We will go through them because we do have some time left. Um, so feel free, any questions that you might have had that popped up throughout the webinar, please feel free to send them in. We look forward to hearing them. So we have one question here um, for Sheldon specifically, if any of you else um, had completed co-op or an internship or something when all of this hit, what was it like to complete that when all of this kind of came around? Yeah, so when I was um, like in co-op, I did mine at TELUS down in downtown Toronto. So when everything started to rise, like, you know, everyone was aware of it. So at the office, you know, everyone was like, you know, washing their hands more frequently Get the janitors come up, you know, three times, you know, three times in a day to, you know, clean the water, sanitize everything. So, you know, as an intern there, as even an employee there, you just felt like, oh, like it's relatively safe, like very safe. You know, everyone's, you know, washing their hands, you know, very hygienic. Well, once it's funny because right probably like a week before everyone like all of us went into lockdown um i caught bronchitis so literally the week before i messaged my you know employer I'm like hey like i got like a really bad cough right now like I'll, it's probably best for me not to come in so i got checked out you know luckily not covid it was just bronchitis and stuff and then basically um everything was just work from home from there like it was very hard to adjust to because you know you had some things in the office but you can't get and then um, in terms of working from home, it's really not that different. Well, at least for me, because I worked the office desk job, so it wasn't bad. Um, everything can be done online. Um, just like what we mentioned before, like being more strict with like, because you're going to be at home the whole day. So if you have siblings like me or like I live with my grandparents too, you know, definitely they do get bored and do want to come bother you. You do have to be more strict with that. Um, 
So work was fine. Everything was normal besides that. But then after returning the equipment and everything um, was just, they ship you a box, put all the equipment back in and then you, you ship it back to the, down to the office. And then, yeah, like it was just honestly like a surprise because no one really knew what was going on. We thought it would just be like a two week lockdown type of thing, but it just ended up being a whole four months. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't think any of us were kind of expecting the impact it would have. And it all happened so quickly. One day the world was moving at a pretty normal pace and it just felt like it was the next day that things just kind of totally tilted. Um, did anyone else work or go through some sort of um, co-op internship change during COVID that they would like to share? No, fantastic. Uh, we do have another question. I think it's a really good one. Uh, we actually have a couple. We'll go through these a little bit more briefly. Um, how can we start preparing for classes if we want to get ahead? Do you have maybe one kind of uh, quick suggestion for what you would do to start preparing for classes early? Uh, we can start with Daniel. Um, so I think a good suggestion would be to um, research the course online or I guess research uh, whichever courses you think you may struggle in or you may need to be more prepared for. Um, definitely uh, keep your old notes because I think I could have been very um, involved in my notes with uh, some of my first year courses. Like statistics is a good one to check over your notes for a couple of the units. Um, but yeah, I think there's, if you search um, your course online for specific to your university, some things like My Course Hero, which um, I'm not sure if it's like a, a quality source, but it, they have like some syllab syllabuses and things like that that'll give you like a description of the course and things like that. Yeah. Awesome. Lily? Oh, I think you may be muted. Oh, I unmuted you there, or maybe not. Oh, does it work now? I'm oh, yep. sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, so kind of what I did was I got all my textbooks early and I kind of like read some of them over, just kind of get like, see what the class was gonna be like beforehand. Um, I also like prepared like my notes for each class. like. I set up like a document saying like, oh, this is my document for Friday the 17th notes. So I already had my document prepared when I went into class. Um, also, I met all of my professors before my classes started. For this year, it's gonna be a bit different, but I would recommend, at least Western's doing it, but um, you're allowed to book like a Zoom chat with your professor so if, or an academic counselor. So I visited my academic counselor and all of my professors before class started so they could see my face and get to know me and establish a connection so that I could always reach out. And again, I think Sidra mentioned it earlier, not be another generic face in the crowd, but have your professors know you because it'll help again if you're applying to research, if you're applying to like a co-op where they worked or if you're applying to anything that you need their help for, they'll be more likely to help you because they'll remember you. Absolutely. Just because we're running a little bit low on time, we'll move on to another question for Sidra and Sheldon. Um, do you recommend working in university and college? We can specify, uh, especially first year. How do you feel about getting a job in that first year of university or college? I can start. Um, so first semester, I didn't work just because I really wanted to get into the swing of things. Um, but I actually started working in my second semester and I did two jobs. I did um, tutoring part time, which was nice so I could set my hours. So perhaps maybe look for something like that. Um, but I also did work study. Sorry. Um, I also did work study and it was okay. Like it was five to 10 hours a week. It was manageable for myself. But I would just say like, see how your first semester goes and then that will give you some more insight on uh, if you want to start working. Um, in second semester. And I like working because it just, it teaches you um, a lot of skills and you have something to put on your resume and something outside of academics. Absolutely. Sheldon, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, like I, a lot of my friends, um, they, they work part-time while doing school too. Really definitely depends on you as an individual. If you know, you are a very well-disciplined, you maximize the time in your day, definitely. but you know like I said if you're in school you know your top priority is to be a student first 
So, you know, Sidra with working to get a, you know, if you are going to work during the school year, make sure definitely your grades don't slip. Um, you know, we all do, especially like right now and during like the teenage years, like, you know, we have all the energy, but no money to spend. But, you know, make sure, you know, if school is not that bad of an issue and then, you know, you guys still have extra time left, definitely do get a job. Yeah, you know, you guys might as well learn something along the way with your free time rather than just, you know, spending the free time just like, you know, watching YouTube or Netflix. So, yeah. For sure. And definitely making some money never hurts. Um, if you can look through your university's career specific center, uh, because universities will offer campus jobs, might be a little different with everything going on, um, but they can offer you jobs that are a little bit more conducive to your schedule just because they're run by the university and they understand the student experience pretty much more than any other employer could. Um, one final question before we kind of wrap up. Um, it's a little bit more on the social side. How do you recommend staying on top of group chats and overall maintaining connections with people online because it's just as difficult if not harder to maintain online connections as it is in-person connections would anyone like to start off on this i can start off um so yeah group chats are kind of daunting sometimes especially when you have a couple hundred or like over 50 people and it's almost constantly like binging your phone and it's kind of insane. Sometimes you have to put them on mute. I would say for the big group chats, it's, it's kind of impossible to be able to monitor it all the time. You're never going to be able unless you stay hours trying to like scroll back and read it all. So it's in my like best opinion, I would recommend creating maybe smaller group chats off that bigger group chat more specifically, those you're able to keep track of a bit more. So maybe if you're not available, you don't have to scroll for 10 minutes to like see everything that's happening. But yeah, definitely take those big group chats and like cut them into smaller like chunks if you can. Um, it'll be way easier to monitor them that way. Sure, any other additions we would like to put on? Um, I actually have one. So I. Just like Lily said, it's it's a bit overwhelming to have all, like if there's 50 people in a group chat at once, but I think it's definitely a good idea to maybe try and um, touch base with like, touch, I said touch base, that's so professional, um, <laughs> but like get to know someone individually, like if you see someone who says something funny in the big group chat, like message them and be like, hey, that's hilarious or something and make some personal like one-on-one -on -one relationships. Those are really good and um, that's how you make some of your best friends. Uh, even without the pandemic, that's how I made a few of my best friends going into first year. So I think it's a great idea to try and get individuals. Yeah, Sidra, Sheldon, anything to add on there? Yeah, for sure. Um, like, like Daniel said, like what I did was, because um, we do have like group chat for like prospective courses too. And definitely people are just always asking questions and stuff like that. And, you know, we all try to help each other out. And sometimes if, you know, someone's really active and then sometimes like what I did was, which I usually never do, but I actually did, it was to just actually reach out to them like privately, like what Daniel said and say like, hey, like, you know, I'm actually stuck on, you know, say this question too. Like, what are your thoughts and like, honestly, your perspective of things. And then just small things like that can actually go a long way because like after that, you just end, end up having like normal conversations and they do end up being like one of your best friends too. So it's pretty fun and amazing too. <laughs> oh, for sure. Sidra? So I'm just going to say that I know people are shy, but video calls and actually having your face is, is really good for connection. So when you have your smaller study groups or, you know, your friend that you're studying with, actually having your camera and your face there, it helps things seem a little bit more meaningful than usual. For sure. It definitely gives the human connection that is going to be a little bit uh, differently approached now that we're coming into this. Um, I guess final thoughts on my end. I would also recommend now that timetabling is starting, getting in touch with the people that you're going to have tutorials or lectures with once you get your class schedules and creating smaller group chats off of that. So that way you can still kind of get in touch with people in your program without the daunting numbers of potentially hundreds of students in a Facebook group that you really can't keep up with. Also, as someone who doesn't like to socially interact with people all the time, don't be afraid to put do not disturb on because I know sometimes it can be very overwhelming. Um, one more quick question from Sarah. I'll just have one of you answer this before we move on. Would you suggest reaching out to profs now or maybe waiting a little while? Lily, if you'd like to pitch in. 
reach out to your prop, maybe not now, but definitely the week before school starts. Um, especially now, the most important thing is a lot of classes are being minimized and a lot of people who aren't able to get their classes that they needed to because they were already full, profs are actually suggesting that if you email them a week before, you can audit the class or you can, they are able to constantly monitor the drop in, drop out rates and they can notify you if class opens up. So definitely the week before school, get in contact with your profs. Absolutely. Um, and just for what would you say? So that was another question, Lily, if you'd just like to add on, how would you kind of break the ice with a professor? Hi, my name's Lily. I want to, or I am in your class. I'm really interested in this topic. Maybe mention some of their research if you actually know it. If, if not, that's fine. But I'm really interested in this topic and ask them a question. So it's not just an introduction, but they have a reason to respond to you. So ask them a question, whether it has to do with their course or about how the class is going to go, anything, but just make sure they know you're interested in their topic. You know them somewhat and that they have a reason to respond to you. Absolutely. Some perfect advice there. So I would like to give a huge thank you to our wonderful panelists for the first half of this webinar. You did an absolutely amazing job. Some of the advice that you gave was amazing to me, and I'm sure it is doubly helpful for everyone else attending this panel. So thank you, thank you, thank you. To those who have attended the webinar, you can take a look at the lovely panelists up on your screen right now. Get in touch with them on LinkedIn um, because we're all working on that networking now. Um, so get in touch. Um, if you have any more questions, that's the best way that you can reach out to our panelists. We also want to let you know that we are doing some recruiting. This might be a little bit of an old slide, so I'm going to move right on. Um, we have a couple upcoming webinars. We have two left. Uh, we have General and McGill, which is next week. We are answering all of your questions that you might have missed um, from our previous webinars. And then our final webinar for the summer is going to be university prep. So if you aren't graduated, you haven't graduated high school, but you're getting ready to, that is kind of the webinar that you're going to want to attend. We will also be discussing water Waterloo and Laurier. And we will also be letting you know that if you are struggling to find a way to make some money to go into university, there is a wonderful contest that you can sign up for to try and make some big bucks. This is known as Canada's Luckiest Student, run by the Student Life Network. You may know about it. We are going to toss a little bit of a link into the chat box. If you are interested in signing up for this contest, feel free to go through. Once again, I would like to thank all of our panelists for sharing their amazing opinions. I would like to thank all of you for attending please stay tuned for the Brock webinar if you have the time. Thank you all for being a lovely audience and I will see you all later.